All right. Well, good every uh, good evening, everyone. So I'm Dr. Billy Teets of the uh, Vanderbilt University Dyer Observatory. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our virtual edition of our November Telescope Night. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about some of the tips for buying a telescope and some other observing aids. Um, I'd like to start off by first thanking my colleagues here at the Vanderbilt University Dyer Observatory, uh, Alex Rockefeller, Helen Morissette, and Nathan Griffin, who've been helping to uh, get programs like this going, and also uh, Brian Smokler, who's uh, with VU News and Communications, and he's making sure that our signal is getting broadcast out to you all tonight. So um, a little bit of um, uh, an announcement here. So make sure to check out our webpage, which is dire.vanderbilt.edu. And uh, when we have upcoming events, whether virtual or in-person, we will post details about those events on our homepage. Um, we don't have any in-person events coming up um, as of yet, but uh, we do have a couple of events that will be coming up in December. Uh, two talks um, by uh, folks here at Vanderbilt University, and we will also have our uh, December virtual telescope night or a virtual star party, I should say. And then we will likely have another uh, viewing event around December 21st. So I'm not gonna spoil the, uh, the fun by telling you all the details about that, but just be sure to check out our website for that. So again, thank you all for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the, the discussion. So um, as you're probably very well aware, tonight we are going to be talking about uh, some tips for buying a telescope. So um, the way we're going to do this tonight, um, Alex and Helen will be monitoring our uh, YouTube stream for questions. And as we're going through our discussion tonight, I'm not going to try to take up too much time by talking. Um, I'm going to do some demonstrations, kind of show you some of these different uh, items, and we'll talk about some of the benefits and things. But uh, we'll probably be doing questions during the presentation as well, instead of waiting to the very end. So um, if we have an onslaught of questions at one point, we'll try to get to at least a few of those. And then we'll make note of those questions and get back to them at the end. So if we didn't get to your question, uh, just hang tight and we'll, we'll do that um, um, uh, in consideration of time. Um, I do want to start out by saying that um, the information that I'll be giving tonight, a lot of it is based on my own personal experience. Others may have had different experiences, but um, when we're talking about how to get the right telescope or what to look for when getting a telescope or other uh, observing aids, there's often no one single correct answer. So just kind of take that into consideration. And we'll also be showing a few different brands or models of telescopes and observing aids. And uh, myself or, or Vanderbilt or Dyer Observatory, we are not endorsing any particular ones of these. We're not getting commissions or anything like that. I'm just using, for, using them for demonstration purposes. So our outline for tonight. So we're going to talk about some of the basic background about telescopes, such as the main types, some of their advantages and disadvantages. We'll even get into things like the different types of mounts. And uh, we'll also give some recommendations on, on these things. Uh, we'll also be talking about some of the observing aids that you can get in addition to a telescope. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about some of the, the targets that you can observe with these particular things and what you can expect to see and maybe what you won't expect to see. And then uh, finally, as we've talked about before, we'll definitely be doing some question and answer um, and, and you know, kind of showing each of these telescopes kind of one on one there. So very basics of a telescope. Well, there are several main groups of telescopes. The first and probably the most famous is the refracting telescope. And so in this diagram, you see on the left an actual refracting telescope. And on the right side, you see a cutaway view of this style of telescope. And so the main components of this style are a large lens or a um, couple of lenses at the very front, which are called the objective lens. They're responsible for gathering light and focusing it down to a second lens, which is called the eyepiece. And then there's a, basically a tube that is going to hold these components in alignment with one another so that we can actually see the image. Now, again, this is one of the most famous types of telescopes. It was the first to be invented. Um, and again, typically what people will think of when they hear the word telescope. 
One of the big drawbacks of this type of telescope is something known as chromatic aberration. Oops. So chromatic aberration is a color distortion. So on the left side view, we're looking through a small telescope that is really suffering from this color distortion, or this chromatic aberration. On the right side is kind of a diagram showing how white light, when it goes through a prism, breaks up into its various components. So um, what I want you to notice is that, you know, with this, this prism here, it, it's the, in the shape of essentially a triangle. Now, if I go back one slide, Look at this objective lens. Look right up there, right where I'm circling. Notice how that objective lens is essentially a triangle in shape. So one of the issues with these types of telescopes is that um, they often suffer from this type of color distortion. Uh, there are ways to combat this. Uh, one of the main ways is to actually take not one, but two lenses of differing materials and combining them at the front of the telescope. So as the light enters the first lens, and starts to break apart, the second lens will catch that light and kind of reconverge it into, uh, into more of a white light. Now, it won't do this perfectly, but um, there are telescopes that, are, um, that get quite expensive, which really alleviate this chromatic aberration. Um, I'll give you an example. This is a typical, or I shouldn't say a typical, but this is an example of a refracting telescope. So if I turn it towards you, you can see the glare from the, the lens up at the front here. And then at the back, we've got our eyepiece. Now this particular one, like we also illustrated in that previous slide, it has a 90 degree component to it. So this is often referred to as a star diagonal or um, a 90 degree angle. And so this basically just redirects the light so that you don't have to uh, essentially crane your neck in order to look through this telescope comfortably. Okay. Um, now this one, um, I'm not sure if you can see it very well, but it says achrome on the front or acro on the front of it. That stands for achromat. So this telescope has a set of lenses at the front that will really reduce, but not completely eliminate that color distortion. Okay. There are other types known as or apochromatic uh, refractors, and those do an even better job. So for those really expensive versions of these refractors, uh, you can really, really reduce that, um, that color distortion where you don't really notice it. Um, the drawback is that you pay for that because you have to grind lenses. Each lens has its own uh, two surfaces. So that means that these telescopes have to have lenses that have four perfectly curved surfaces that are made out of specific materials of a very high quality. That's really going to add to the, the cost of that. So um, as uh, Theo Wellington, who was one of our, our presenters at our last uh, virtual star party had said, um, a telescope or a refracting telescope um, for an amateur, about the largest that you're probably going to see is about a five inch wide telescope. And when I say that, I mean that the lenses are about five inches wide. This one's about a four inch. Because once you get up about the five inch size, you're getting into some really costly telescopes. I and mean, we're talking uh, easily over $10,000 just for the telescope itself, okay? But you get really nice images, uh, beautiful views of the planets. Um, so uh, if you're willing to pay it, then you can get a, a, a really nice view. But you don't have to go with the refractor to get a really nice view of the cosmos. So if we go back to our, our slide here, let's talk a little bit about um, another style of telescope. This is called the reflecting telescope. So as its name suggests, this type of telescope simply reflects the light. And in doing so, it's able to form an image. So in our diagram here, um, on the left side, we have a cutaway view of something called a Newtonian telescope. So the light would enter through this telescope uh, opening and it would intercept this primary mirror, which you notice has a curve to it. That curved mirror is able to focus light towards a second mirror. This one happens to be flat. Its job is just to redirect the light out the side of the telescope to our eyepiece. Now I had mentioned that you know, these are reflectors, yet this one has an eyepiece. When we're talking about a reflector versus a refractor or whatever type of telescope, we're not considering the eyepiece as well. We're just talking about the main part of the telescope. 
So uh, for this uh, example over on the right side, the light would enter in through the top of the telescope here. It would travel down to the bottom, hit that curved mirror, which would then focus the light back up towards the front. The second mirror is right in there and it sends the light out to the side to the eyepiece. So one thing you'll notice is that the eyepiece and the opening, or the aperture as we call it, are both at the front of the telescope. So when folks first see this style of telescope, if they've never encountered it before, they will often bring this telescope down so that the top appears actually at the bottom because they see the eyepiece there and figure that's the, the, uh, the bottom of the telescope. So, um, so this again is a type of uh, reflecting telescope. Now this particular style of telescope is known as a Dobsonian telescope and it's named after John Dobson. Now he didn't invent the actual telescope itself, but what he did popularize was this very simplistic base that it sets on. So um, it's what we call an out, az uh, out azimuth mount. Um, so it basically moves up, down, left, and right. Um, because the, the mount and even the tube that's holding the mirrors can be made of relatively inexpensive materials, most of your money goes into the actual optics of the telescope. So um, these telescopes also tend to get a pretty wide field of view. Now on the left side there, that's uh, what we would consider uh, or often call a classic Dobsonian, kind of looks like a cannon. Uh, on the right side is a truss design telescope. So instead of a solid tube, it now just uses a, a truss work to suspend the different components. And in fact, in this one, you can even on the right, you can even see that secondary mirror right in there, and the eyepiece is right over here. So we have a few examples of these, uh, these Newtonian, or what are often referred to as the Dobsonian telescopes. So again, the Dobsonian mainly refers to the base that it's setting on. Newtonian refers to the actual optical design. So Isaac Newton was the first to invent this optical design for a telescope. He invented the first reflecting telescope. Move this out of the way here. So on our tabletop, and I'll bring this closer in just a moment, uh, this is what we would call a tabletop reflector. Um, it, you notice that it's very short. Um, it's pretty lightweight. I would say I'd estimate it probably weighs about 15 pounds, but um, it's easily transported. Bring it up a little bit closer to where you can see it. Oops, I'm starting to get a little green screen effect there. Um, but notice that it just moves up and down, and then the base it can actually swivel around. So that is what we call an out azimuth mount. Very simple. All you got to do is just take it outside, set it down somewhere, and then start looking through the eyepiece. You don't have to worry about aligning or anything like that. Now, because this is a short telescope, it often helps to have a little table to set it on. So um, uh, that can be a, a little bit of a disadvantage if you don't have one, uh, one of those little tables handy or something. But I'll pull off the, the top here and give you an idea of how this works. So right up at the front here, where my finger is, that is the secondary mirror. And if I tilt it down, you'll see the reflection of that primary mirror in the back. So the light will enter in here, it'll travel down, reflect back up towards the front, and then out to the side. So again, it's a nice little tabletop reflector. Now this particular one is a, what we would say is a four and a half inch telescope. Uh, we'll talk about aperture in just a moment, but when we talk about telescope size, we don't worry about how long it is or how heavy it is. We worry about how wide the opening is. You want to get as much light gathered as possible, and that's going to depend on the size of your opening or your aperture as it's called. So again, this one is a four and a half inch, um, which technically is about 113 millimeters wide. Um, give you another example here. This is another four and a half inch Newtonian reflector or Dobsonian reflector, however you want to call it. But you notice that this one is much longer. This one has a, what we say is a longer focal length. In the end, the only main difference is, is that you get a narrower field of view. 
Okay, so there's still great telescopes. Um, this one is a little bit easier just to sit directly on the ground, um, especially if, um, if you're working with kids, then they may have to stoop over just a little bit, but they can very easily move this around and, and look through it. Um, now this style of telescope, you notice it's getting kind of big. Um, it comes on its, its swiveling base. This style though, you typically can very quickly undo two latches, or in this case, two springs, and that will allow you to simply lift this off. This weighs, I would guess, probably eight pounds. So very easy to transport. Um, you can take this, um, you know, like especially if you're going out in the country somewhere and want to observe with it, it's very easy to take this off, set it in the, the back seat of the car, make sure to strap it down so it can't move around, and then simply just come back and get your base. In fact, this one is light enough, or this size is light enough, that let me reassemble it here. And again, it's just a very quick assembly. You can even just carry it by the handle that it has on its back, okay? Now, we can quickly increase in size. For example, over here is a 12 inch. So it's main mirror in the back is 12 inches. I'll bring it down to where you can kind of see here. Might be able to get a little bit of a view. Yeah, you can start to see the 12 inch mirror in the back there. This one is more of a beast. Um, this one, it's not easy to, uh, to carry out in a single piece. In fact, I would not recommend it. Um, I mean, as in carrying it out in a single piece, but you can quickly disengage the springs and you can essentially bear hug it or even just carry it normal and take the base out and then come back or take the tube out and then come back and, and get your base. These also um, you can get from the manufacturer, uh, basically tote bags. They're like big duffel bags. You lay it down on the ground, slide the tube in there, zip it up, and it's got two shoulder straps. So you can just sling it over your shoulder, which is actually much easier to, to transport these guys. So again, that is the, the Dobsonian telescope. And if we were going to recommend a telescope, that's the style that we would go with. Um, they come in many different sizes from the four and a half inch size, either the short tube or the long tube. Uh, they can come in six inch, eight inch, 10 inch, 12 inch, um, and we can go even higher than that. Um, a small one like this is probably going to run you a, a little over $100. Um, this one over here, uh, probably about the same, but less than 200. If you go up to about a six inch, then you probably get over the $200 threshold. Eight inch, probably closer to 300. Uh, 10 inch, um, that one, depending on what the tube is made of, you can go between four and 500 typically. Uh, this one, even though it's two inches wider at 12 inches, uh, it was substantially more. So it's kind of a, it's kind of like a little bit of an exponential curve there. Um, for size, I would probably, well, a four and a half inch, especially if you've got somebody that is just getting into astronomy. Maybe it's a child or a grandchild, niece or nephew or something like that. Um, you can start them out small. Each of these telescopes will easily get, uh, for example, uh, the moons of Jupiter or the rings of Saturn. You can even see some faint fuzzy objects uh, if you've got dark locations uh, to view from. But the bigger the, the telescope that you get, the more light you're gonna gather and the more detail you're going to be able to see. So you could start out with a very small one and then later on uh, upgrade and spend a little bit more money and get one of the, the larger ones. Um, I've used um, all of those different sizes that I named off, four and a half, six, eight, 10, and 12. And um, if, you're, if you've got somebody that you uh, know is going to be into astronomy or has already shown a very strong interest in it, um, putting a little bit of extra money in to maybe get an eight inch telescope would be worth it, in my opinion. Um, one thing I try to reiterate to people is that even though you may spend a little bit more money at the front, these telescopes, if you take care of them, which doesn't take much, they will literally last you a lifetime. Okay. And by taking care of them, I mean, once you're done with them, just put the little dust cover back on, maybe drape a little tarp or a bag over it just to kind of keep 
uh, dust off the outside, which that's easily cleaned. Um, don't drop it or bang it against something um, if you are moving it around. And if you store it, just make sure that it really can't get water on it or extremely high humidity. So I have one um, that I, have, I, I stored in my garage and I would just generally just drape a, a big trash bag over it. So, um, you know, even if they get a little dust on the mirror, that's fine. And, and speaking of which, these mirrors are not like the mirrors that you would have in your bathroom or like a, a makeup mirror, which is curved. Um, those mirrors all have a glass coating on the front. These mirrors are front luminized, which means that the reflective aluminum coating, in fact, I've got one here, the reflective aluminum coating on these mirrors is directly on the surface. So if you touch it, you literally are touching the aluminum. They, these are extremely easily scratched. If I come up a little bit closer and I turn this, you'll see, let me try to get it out of my face there. You'll probably see some of the, uh, the scratches on it. This is an old telescope mirror we pulled out of a, uh, a telescope that was given to us. But when I say easily scratched, I do mean that literally taking a Kleenex uh, and just lightly going across it, hold it in the light, you'll see the fine scratches. And I, I speak from experience on that. So there are ways to clean mirrors. Um, I'm not going to go into that tonight, but there are good reliable sources online on how to do that. But the, the bottom line is, unless you've basically taken a handful of dust, like literally a handful and just thrown it on your mirror, you're really not going to notice any image quality difference. So if it gets a little dust on there, don't worry about it. Okay. I know that's hard for, for some folks like myself, you know, I see the dust on it. I've got to clean it off, but it really will not make a difference in what you see. Okay. Um, let me go through one other uh, bit here. So those were the, the Dobsonian telescopes. And again, um, uh, th this is the style that we, that we would recommend, or at least I would recommend. Um, there is another type of reflecting telescope. Uh, so ignore the telescope on the right for the moment, but look at the diagram on the left. This is what we call a Cassegrain reflector. So this one also has a big mirror in the back. This mirror has a hole in it though. And as you see in this cross section, when light comes in and reflects up to that second mirror, the mirror doesn't send the light out the side. It actually sends it back down through that hole and out the back to where the eyepiece would be. So this is an example of one of those telescopes. So the main mirror would be right in here. Second mirror would be right here. So the light comes in, hits that mirror, bounces up, bounces yet again, and then comes out the back to the eyepiece. So if you have been to the Dyer Observatory and observed through any of our large telescopes that were in one of our domes, you were observing through one of these Cassegrain reflectors. Um, so these, because of the way the light is reflected a couple of times and because of the, the curvature of that second mirror, um, these telescopes are, they come in a, a essentially a smaller physical package. And these are great for doing uh, especially if you're wanting to get into photography work, which we'll touch on in a little bit. Now on the right, this is a variation of that. This is not just a Cassegrain telescope. This is a Schmidt Cassegrain. So the Schmidt part comes from the fact that this one has this glass corrector plate right at the front. Okay, so that's called the Schmidt corrector. And these were um, corrector plates that were required for this style of telescope when uh, when mirrors were uh, first being ground uh, to form these reflecting telescopes. The problem was that the curvature uh, that was being used to, uh, to uh, shape these mirrors would not allow them to focus light properly. It would be a little bit out of focus. And so these corrector plates were essentially like a pair of glasses for the telescope. Had the added benefit of, instead of uh, having to use supports, like rod supports to hold the second mirror, you could just use the glass itself which also helped to keep dust off of that, that very scratchable mirror in the back. So um, again, these are, um, these are good for, for visual work, but they're also good for photographic work. So if you were really trying to get into astrophotography, um, this would be probably uh, one of your, uh, uh, be on your short list for a type of telescope. Um, I do have a couple of examples of those, um, those telescopes, which by the way, when we incorporate reflectors 
and the uh, and uh, some sort of a, a lens like a corrector plate so that we're basically merging the properties of reflecting and refracting telescopes. We get the third group of telescopes, which is known as the catadioptrics. Okay, so a regular Cassegrain like this guy doesn't have that corrector plate. He would just be a reflector. Okay, but there are a couple of different types of of these catadioptrics that you might come across if you're looking for a telescope. Um, I'll go ahead and say that the catadioptrics tend to be on the higher side when you compare sizes of telescopes uh, in catadioptrics versus, say, the reflectors. Okay. Um, over here, this is one of those Schmidt Cassegrains. So I will turn it here. Um, hopefully, you can see it a little bit. Let me try to adjust this just a bit as well. So you'll notice the right there is the reflection of that second or that primary mirror. The secondary mirror is right up here. And then there's this glass corrector plate on the front. So that's one style, that's the Schmidt Cassegrain. And then this little guy here, which is a, a really cute little telescope called a Questar. This one is another style called a Maksutov Cassegrain. So this one, it's also got the, the mirror at the back, which you can see the reflection there. This little spot up here uh, behind that is the secondary mirror, but this one's corrector plate. I don't know if I can show it very well. It's, it's kind of hard to see, but it's got uh, what's known as a meniscus lens at the front. So it's not a flat lens. It's kind of like a, a bowl shape. And that's another one of those corrector uh, lenses. So, um, this one, it's really cute, and these are also good for photographic use, but because you've got to have this very specific curvature of this, this front lens, that can add to the cost as well. But I just wanted to throw that out there in case you come across those and wonder what they are, uh, what, you know, what we're actually looking at. So now, as we mentioned before, bigger uh, tends to be better for telescopes. So not only are you increasing the opening to let more light in, but you're also uh, increasing the resolution of your telescope. So for example, if you had really good sky conditions, the atmosphere is very calm, and you looked at Saturn with say a, a four inch telescope, and then you looked at Saturn again with a 12 inch telescope, and you had your eyepieces set up so that you had the same magnification for both. What you would see is that through the 12 inch, you would get better detail on Saturn. You'd be able, in fact, you'd be able to zoom in just a little bit more and still be able to resolve some, some features of Saturn's rings, for example. And not only that, but through the, let's say the four inch, you might see one or two of Saturn's moons, whereas through the 12 inch, you'd probably see about four or five. But of course, if you get a bigger telescope, that means it's gonna increase the cost as well. So there's kind of a trade off there. Um, when we talk about telescope aperture being critical, that's one of the big things that uh, large observatories are concerned with. So for example, um, on the right side is an artist rendering of the giant Magellan telescope, which is essentially seven telescope mirrors put together to form a much larger mirror. And on the left is just one of those mirrors. And so you can see how, um, how large it is compared to the audience or to the, the scientists behind them. So, um, and even for amateurs, they can get something called am or aperture fever. So for example, this is one of those trussed Dobsonians. I believe this one was close to 48 inches in diameter, if I recall correctly. Um, and typically had to be disassembled to be transported. And then there was, uh, it essentially took up a whole garage there. But, um, you know, we can, those that really get into astronomy, they, they're essentially never satisfied with the size of the telescope. So they get the 10 inch telescope, then they wonder, well, what can I see with a 12 inch telescope? Or what about a 16 inch? So uh, one other thing I wanna mention about aperture size. Uh, in most cases, aperture size is, if, or, you know, bigger is better. However, let's say you're in downtown Nashville. You also need to take into account your viewing location. So if you're planning on observing strictly from downtown Nashville, a 12 inch telescope isn't really going to get you anything more than say a four inch telescope because there's so much light pollution. 
So, um, but if you've got a good dark location, uh, maybe out in the country somewhere where you can see the Milky Way overhead, then a bigger telescope would benefit you. And if you don't have a location that you can always observe from, you can um, also look up um, uh, uh, astronomy events like star parties. So for example, uh, typically, well, this is pre-COVID times, um, there would be two star parties out at Fall Creek Falls, uh, which is over towards East Tennessee. And that's, there are some of the darkest skies there in Tennessee. And so um, uh, amateur astronomers would bring their telescopes there, they'd set them up and they would observe all night. And one of the nice things about that is even if you didn't have a telescope, you'd be welcome to go to that star party and look through other people's telescopes. Um, so if you're not really sure, you know, which size telescope you wanna go with, uh, one thing that you could do is go to one of these star parties and actually get to look so through some of the different uh, size telescopes to get a feel for what um, each size would get you. Um, others, other astronomers there might be doing uh, uh, astrophotography, and so you can kind of get uh, some insights on that um, and kind of see the equipment that they're using. Um, so like the Barnard Seaford Astronomical Society is one of the local astronomy clubs uh, here in Nashville. Memphis uh, has the Memphis Astronomical Society, which is a participant in our virtual star parties. But they do these kinds of things uh, where they have these star parties where people are just invited to come. Or you know, you hear about it and they say, we're gonna be here for a certain period of time. So come on out and, and check it out. And you know, the amateur astronomers there love to talk about the telescopes and what they're looking at. And they you know, love educating people about this because it's what they are very passionate about. Um, so now, uh, one final thing about telescopes, and then we're going to move on to some observing aids. You may see the different types of mounts. Uh, for example, when we were looking at the um, the reflect, or excuse me, the refractor, you notice that its mount. Let me back it up here. Its mount looks a little bit strange. So this mount, you notice that it's. Uh, one of its axes of rotation right through here. This is its main axis of rotation. This is known as a German equatorial mount. Now this style of mount is not really meant to just be plopped down and you start observing with it. You can if you want to, but it's not really meant for that. This is meant to be aligned so that as you turn this knob or uh, there's another knob on the other side here you can't really see very well. But as you gently turn those or even attach a motor to it, it will track the object that you're looking at. So you don't have to keep adjusting as this object is moving across the sky. But again, that requires alignment. Now, one of the reasons that we recommend the Dobsonian telescope is because as we saw, it has a very simple base. In fact, if I go back to our diagram here, so here is our equatorial mount here. So again, it's gonna require uh, the user to align it so that uh, the telescope can track properly. You don't have to do that if you don't want to, but that makes it so much easier to move the telescope around and find objects. The type of mount that the Dobsonian has is what we call the alt azimuth mount because it moves in altitude, which is um, up and down. So if we go back to our little tabletop example, so altitude is just moving up and down and then azimuth is moving left and right. So again, these don't really require a setup, especially this particular kind, because it doesn't have any computer or anything on it. You are basically going to be moving it to what you want to look at. Um, and actually having said that, a number of manufacturers will have these you know, classic Dobsonians, which you just sit down and move around yourself. They'll have some that are like, I think it's the Orion company has something called the Intelliscope. And it looks a lot like these except it has a little computer pad. Now the telescope doesn't actually move, but once you get it aligned, which is relatively easy, the computer will then tell you where to move that telescope. It'll tell you to move it up, down, or left and right. And it's basically keeping track as you move it. So it doesn't move it for you, but it tells you how to move it. And because these guys have pretty wide fields of view, I've used them before and they're pretty accurate. So that might be an option if you actually want to try to find some of these things um, with the assistance of a computer. And there are even the versions that are automated, so they do have the motors. But again, adding any of these bells and whistles is going to really increase the cost dramatically. 
Um, and again, uh, the telescope is only going to be good at finding stuff as well as that it's, it's aligned. So if it's got poor alignment, chances are you're not going to get to see the, uh, the object that you're looking for and it's going to be a, a disappointment and, and ends up with frustration. So um, we also recommend, or I should say, I also recommend not going with that in telescope model or the go-to models. I highly recommend, especially for those who are just starting out, to get one of the very simple ones. So it's not gonna cost you a lot of money and you have to do all the object finding. And the reason I recommend that is that you don't have to worry about the frustration about computers, but it forces you to learn the sky. So going back about 20 years ago, that's when I got my first Dobsonian and uh, just taking it out in the yard and getting my little star map and learning some of the stars and then saying, okay, I want to try to find this little cluster of stars. So I would then have to then manually move the telescope and locate my, my, my first bright star and then say, okay, now I got to go down a little bit till I find that this star, then hang a right, go over two more stars and there's my cluster. So when I would do that and I would finally arrive at my target, it was so satisfying. Uh, we have telescopes here at at Dyer Observatory that, you know, at the push of a button, it will find whatever object we want and have it centered. I could be at those telescopes all night and I would get pretty bored very quickly just having it go and find all these different objects. But then if I have to find two objects on my own, I get so much more satisfaction. So um, again, that's another reason why you wanna go with the simpler one, especially if you're just starting out with this. Then afterwards, um, if you wanna get something that's more automated, then, then try that. So uh, back to, to, to uh, just a couple more slides here. Let's just mention a few of the observing aids. So when you get your telescope, it will often come, uh, it typically always comes with at least one eyepiece. In some cases, it'll come with two eyepieces. Um, when you get your telescope, you also maybe want to look at considering or maybe want to consider getting one or two other eyepieces. And so there are a tremendous number of eyepieces out there. Um, and they come by uh, different names like Plossel or Kellner or, or Negler. Um, and all of those are, are referring to different optical designs of the, um, of the eyepieces. And so some of the, as you can see in the, in the picture here, they really uh, can vary in physical size as well. That doesn't mean necessarily that one will magnify more than the other, but it will change the field of view. So for example, um, this very large eyepiece on the right here, uh, this one actually would have about the same magnification as this eyepiece. However, when I would look into this eyepiece and I've had the opportunity to do this, the field of view is so wide that I would literally have to move my head around a little bit in order to see the entire field of view that's being shown to me. Whereas uh, the little plossel down here, uh, it's a good eyepiece, but it has a narrower field of view. So it looks more like you're looking through a, um, a tube. Okay, so you can see the edge of the field of view much more easily in one of these guys than you can in like this big one up here. They come in a few different sizes. The most common are the inch and a quarter and two inch. So when you get your telescope, make sure that um, your telescope is set up to where um, it, or, or let me rephrase that. Make sure that if you wanna get new eyepieces for your telescope or additional eyepieces, that you get the right size because um, some telescopes can only accept the one and a quarter inch eyepieces. They won't be able to accept a two inch eyepiece because it's too wide. Which by the way, when we say two inch, we mean the actual width of the barrel down here, okay? Now, some like the, um, let me give you a, another little view here. Um, so like our, our big guy here, the telescopes, especially the larger aperture telescopes, they are typically made uh, to accept both of those eyepieces. So this one has a much wider opening. It will accept an eyepiece like this one right here. So this is one of those two inch eyepieces, okay? So I can just pop it in right in there, set the thumb screw, and I'm good to go. I can focus a little bit if I need to. Um, but let's say I bought this eyepiece and I wanted to put it on here. Well, unfortunately, 
this little telescope is only made to accept the one and a quarter inch eyepieces. I'll give you a little view of that. So there's the opening, one and a quarter inches. Here's my, my big eyepiece there. So it won't work on that, okay? Now my big guy over there, it accepts the two inch. It'll even accept the one and a quarter inch. You may say, well, how does that work? Because it's so much smaller. They, they will typically come with a little adapter. It's basically a spacer, okay? So this is two inches wide right here. I pop my one and a quarter inch in there, snug down the thumb screw so it can't fall out. And then that will then slide into the telescope over there. So just keep that in mind when you're uh, looking at getting a telescope. Now the, um, uh, we'd recommend having at least two or three eyepieces and um, getting eyepieces of different focal lengths. So typically these eyepieces are listed by their focal length. For example, um, what we see in this view uh, here, this middle eyepiece, if you can see it on your screen, it says 26 millimeter. That's the focal length of that eyepiece. This one is 6.4 millimeter. So the focal length will determine your magnification. In fact, uh, you can calculate it for yourself. Um, your telescope will have listed on it somewhere its focal length. Take the telescope focal length divided by the number on your eyepiece. That gives you your magnification. Okay, so if your telescope has a thousand millimeter focal length and you put in the 10 millimeter eyepiece, thousand divided by 10 is 100. So you have 100 magnification. Um, Let's see, uh, some of the things that might be mentioned are the field of view and the eye relief. So if you have a large field of view, that's like uh, this one eyepiece on the right. It has a pretty large field of view. So it really gives kind of a breathtaking view when you look into these. It's not just like looking through a straw. It's like putting your uh, eye up to a, a window and trying to look out and see everything. Um, the eye relief, that is how close your eye has to get in order to see the full field of view. So, you know, you don't want to have your eyeball smashed up against the eyepiece. Um, so if you have an eyepiece that's advertising good eye relief, then that might be something to consider. Um, the other thing is when you are using these eyepieces, oops, hold on one second. Um, start out with your lowest magnification which means the biggest number. So if I have a 10 millimeter and a 25 millimeter eyepiece, I would start out with the 25 millimeter because it'll give me my lower magnification. And then I get my object centered that I wanna look at. And then I take that eyepiece out and I put in my 10 millimeter. So don't really ever start out with your low or your highest magnification because you'll have a heck of a time trying to find what you're looking for. Also keep in mind that magnification is not the key here. Uh, like I said before, we can bring the magnification of these telescopes up easily to a thousand power, but um, the views would be horrible, okay? So some of the best views are actually at the lowest magnifications. So when you see these telescopes advertised in department stores and it says, we'll magnify 500 times, well, you can do that with any telescope and the view will be terrible, okay? So ignore the magnification. And again, lowest magnification is often better. Um, in addition to some of the eyepieces, you can also get something called a Barlow lens. And this will essentially double the number of eyepieces that you have because it just simply fits onto the end of one of your eyepieces and it will either double, triple, or even quintuple the magnification of that eyepiece. So I'll give you an example. Here is... Here's a little um, a 2x Barlow, which means it'll, whatever magnification we originally had, it'll multiply it by a factor of two. So here's my, uh, my 25 millimeter eyepiece. Let's say this gave me a magnification of 100. If I slip this guy right on there, get my set screw, snug down my set screw. Then I put that into where the eyepiece goes on the telescope. Now, instead of 100 magnification, I would have 200 magnification. Um, I've got one, I don't have it here with me, but it's a 3X. So if I had used that one instead, then I would have a 300 magnification, OK? 
Okay, so if you've got a, an assortment of eyepieces, which by the way, you can get these in inch and a quarter or two inch, then by getting a Barlow, you've essentially doubled the number of eyepieces that you, that you have. Okay. Um, another key item I would highly recommend is a moon filter. Especially if you get a telescope that's a little bit larger, that moon, especially when it's getting close to full, is going to be really bright in your field of view. Switch back over here. So here is where my, there it goes. So here's a moon filter. Let me uh, stick a piece of paper to me so you can kind of see what it does here. Okay, so now if I hold this up, you'll notice that the view is a little bit darker through that, that filter. So that's gonna attenuate the light of the moon just a little bit. Now you can get them where it's just this and you basically just screw it onto the end of your eyepiece and put that in your telescope. And so your view is a little bit dimmer. Or you can even get those that are called variable polarizers. And I, I really like these because if you've got a full moon, you want more dimming. But if you've got maybe a first quarter moon, maybe you don't want as much dimming. So it's essentially just two of these that you can screw together. Okay, let me adjust this here. Okay, so if we look through here, maybe that's what I want, but maybe the moon is getting uh, brighter and I want a little bit more dimming. So I just turn one of those rings and it lets less light through. Okay, and again, this whole thing just screws onto the end of your, um, your eyepiece. By the way, never use these to try to view the sun. Okay, even if you brought it down to maximum, attenuation, it would still cause uh, irreparable eye damage. So never use the moon filters for the sun. You have to have a special filter for that, which by the way, does not go on the end of the telescope or on the end of the eyepiece. It actually goes on the end of the telescope itself. Um, I don't have one with me tonight, but um, we can discuss that a little bit later if, if need be. All right. Um, We've had questions before about binoculars. So uh, binoculars are, are nothing to be scoffed at, especially if um, you're in a really good dark location. Uh, they're some of the easiest things to use. You don't have to worry about taking out a base and setting that up. You can just hang it on a strap around your neck and just walk out and, and take a look. But these offer a much wider field than the, the telescopes themselves. And so scanning things like the Milky Way that will give you some just absolutely gorgeous views of the Milky Way that you're not going to be able to see in the telescope because you're looking at too small of an area at one time with the telescope. Um, there are a couple of numbers that are on uh, binoculars. In fact, I've got an example here. Let me bring it over. Now this pair of binoculars, this is an astronomy pair of binoculars. Um, as you can see, they're pretty long, which means they're also gonna be heavy. Uh, these, you can get a little bracket that will mount it to a tripod. Um, it's not the best for trying to view directly overhead, but if you're looking out on the horizon or maybe about halfway up in the sky, then the tripod's really nice and it can hold it's very steady for you and you don't have to, your arms don't have to worry about getting tired. So that's another consideration. Um, you know, even a light pair of binoculars over time will start feeling really heavy. So, um, but there are two numbers that'll be listed on your pair of binoculars. This is a pair of 15 by 70s. The 15 means it's going to magnify 15 times. The 70 refers to the diameter of our lenses in millimeters. So if it was a 15 by 100, then that'd be an even wider pair, which would allow you to get more light, which might make the objects uh, in the sky brighter but it would also make them heavier. So, um, you know, these are, even though they're astronomy binoculars, they'd be great for terrestrial viewing, like bird watching or, or whatever. But uh, just keep in mind that, um, you know, not, for binoculars, bigger is kind of better until you have to hold them for a while. So, um, and, and there's a, a lot of different opinions about, you know, the different types of binoculars. So what I would recommend is just going on one of these uh, websites, like maybe Orion, uh, website or Celestron or Mead or any of these manufacturers of binoculars 
look at the reviews. Um, I know that like on the Orion site, uh, a lot of people put in their reviews and it's not just like, yeah, this is a nice pair of binoculars. They actually go into depth about, you know, oh, I bought this and they were remarkably light and I really enjoy using them at night. So um, uh, really for, for something like that, I would highly recommend uh, seeing what other people who have actually used a certain pair you're interested in have to say about them. But uh, these are great uh, for astronomy. Okay, you're not going to be able to zoom in on Saturn with them, but they'll give you some really gorgeous views that you just can't get with a telescope. Okay, something like the Pleiades star cluster. Uh, you can get a couple of the stars of that cluster in one of these telescopes, but you can get the whole thing with a, a pair, even a small pair of binoculars, and it's much more breathtaking than the view that you get with your telescope. Okay. Um, all right. I think I've got just like two or three more slides here. Uh, some other recommended accessories are a red flashlight, uh, maybe a few star maps or field guides, uh, things like, um, you know, you can even get a moon map to learn what some of the craters on the moon are named or how big they actually are. You'd be surprised at how big they actually are, even though they look so tiny in the telescope. Uh, a planisphere, also known as a star wheel, which I'll show you in just a moment. And there's also lots of software out there, especially free software. So if you've got a, a, a laptop or a desktop, I'd highly recommend something like Stellarium. Um, it's free for all of the operating systems. I think there's a phone version as well, although I don't know how well that works. But there's also apps like uh, Starwalk, or I think there was a Skyview, or there's lots of these apps out there where you can basically just hold up your phone to the sky or your iPad or whatever. And move around and it basically shows you the sky and they're, they're really nice and accurate. So um, we often get asked, you know, is there one over the other that you'd prefer? Not really. I mean, they all have, uh, they're all phenomenal uh, uh, bits of software and some of them may have more bells, bells and whistles than the other. But um, you know, I think that you could really just download any of them, especially if they're getting decent reviews and you'd be set. Um, but the, uh, the star wheel, this is another handy tool for learning the night sky. Um, this is a, a really nice, oops, I'm starting to get a reflection there. Oops, I'm really getting a green screen. Um, but basically what it is, is um, it's showing, it's got all the, the, the constellations and stars and things that you'd be able to see from a location like Nashville. You can get them from the Southern hemisphere, but you'd want the Northern hemisphere for Nashville, obviously. But um, around the perimeter, there is, a, a dial that's got dates and then it's kind of hard to see here because of the the art uh, the, the green screening effect but there are times and basically if i wanted to say well what's it going to look like tonight uh november 19th at 8 p.m i would just rotate my dial around Let's see well first i need to find november 19th so right there on my dial and then I'll rotate it around so that the 8 p.m. arrow is pointing at that date. And then that's what you've got shown in here. So this window here, everything that's in this window is what's up in the sky at that date and time for this location. So it, it lists off a number of the stars. It shows the constellations, uh, shows some deep sky objects as well. So it's a great quick way uh, for uh, learning the sky if you don't want to drag out a computer um, or some books or anything like that. In fact, this one ha is plastic, so you don't have to worry about dew forming on it. If you go to our webpage, dire.vanderbilt.edu, uh, we still have from our, our virtual star party, we have links to our own star wheel that you can download and print for yourself. Um, and um, we've also got a link to our, our last star party video uh, where Adam Thans goes through how to actually use one of these. And so, um, there's also a video showing how to assemble one, uh, which is, it's very simple, so, but they're very, very effective tools. And as mentioned before, um, a light, not a white light like we have here, but a red light is really great for astronomy. Um, we want red because uh, when we're in a dark location and we're trying to see these faint objects, the color receptors of your eye are useless in the telescope those, what we call the cones. However, the, um, the uh, rods in your eye, which is kind of surround that central area of your eye, those are very well suited to dark locations. 
and they are very, very sensitive. And so that's what you're actually using when you look in a telescope and are looking at, say, the Andromeda galaxy. So the, the red light will not really stimulate those and wreck your night vision, but it will be enough red light to stimulate the cones so that you can see your way around. And uh, when you get to the, the, wherever you want to be, then you turn that off and your eyes are still set for, for viewing through the telescope. If we use the, the white light, then your cones would stimulate it, be stimulated, your rods would be stimulated as well, and that would wreck your night vision for about 10 to 15 minutes. So uh, you want red light, you don't want to use like a green light or a blue light, the red light is really the one that you want, okay? Um, and I think final thing, is we just recently got asked about a recommendation for a book, and there's lots of different resources out there. First and foremost, I would recommend looking at getting uh, either astronomy or sky and telescope magazine, or you can get them both. Um, they are chock full of information, different information every month. Um, it goes into some of the science of uh, 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 and the fields of astronomy that are going on today. Um, you'll see star charts for each month that the issue is um, for example, this is, uh, what month is this? So this is August of um, a few years ago. So you would find a star chart for that particular month. Uh, there'd be objects highlighted that you can look for, um, reviews about astronomy equipment, other guides. So it's just lots of different information in these. Um, so I'd highly recommend getting one or both of these. There's also things like little field guides. So you can get, um, uh, individual constellations shown and some information about those or maybe individual objects uh, within those constellations. And there are a number of those out there. There's also like um, a, a stargazing guide and I'm not recommending any particular one here, but these will have information about, um, you know, like movements of the sky, uh, telescopes, some of the, the different things that you can observe and um, yeah, it's just a lot of information as well. And then there are also atlases, which are great if you've got your telescope and you wanna start finding some of these objects. So this particular one has individual images of the constellations, and then there are corresponding maps as well to show you where some of the highlighted objects are located. And so this would be a great way to find some of these, these objects. Um, let me make sure, okay. Switch back over. So what can you expect to see? First off, don't expect to see images like you saw in, on the Hubble Space Telescope webpage. Though even um, you know, if you were to look at say an amateur astronomer's website where they post pictures of images that they've acquired, even, um, or, well, let me back up and say that uh, these really gorgeous images that you see those are images that uh, where the telescope and camera have taken long exposures that were often hours to when you tally up all the observing time, sometimes even into days of exposure time. So you're never going to look into a telescope and see like this, this uh, beautiful spiral galaxy just beaming away like you would see in a Hubble Space Telescope image. You'll be able to see some galaxies and they'll look like faint smudges. And if you happen to be in a very dark location with a large telescope, sometimes you can see spiral structure in those, but you're never going to see these extremely colorful images um, in the telescope like you see um, uh, on the internet or in magazines or books. So, uh, and the reason for that is that your eyes are just not sensitive enough. Um, you have to have a lot of light to be able to stimulate the, the color receptors, those cones in your eye. So um, really the only time that you're really going to be able to notice color is when you're looking at the planets or even the stars. Uh, uh, some of these stars will look very blue or very yellow, sometimes even an orangey color. The planets, um, they aren't super colorful, except for maybe Mars or Uranus or Neptune, but Saturn and Jupiter, they tend to have kind of a muted color. A lot of people ask where the color is, why am I not seeing it in color? It's like, well, you are seeing it. It's just that a lot of the color images that you see are processed to help uh, bring out details. 
Um, so especially when you're looking through a reflecting telescope, remember there's no color distortion. You are seeing it as it is. Just sometimes it's too faint uh, to see any color. Um, every once in a while, especially if you're looking in a very large telescope in a very dark location, you might be able to see a tiny bit of color in some of these uh, faint fuzzy objects like these nebulae. There's been uh, one or two times where I've seen some color in, in some of these planetary nebulae or even the Orion Nebula, but mostly they appear as kind of a grayish green color. Okay. Um, when you're looking for faint objects, uh, you want to use something called averted vision. So when you're looking straight at an object, then the light is being focused onto those very densely packed color receptors in your eye. So when you're looking at a galaxy in a telescope, if you look straight at it, it's gonna be very hard to see because that light's going to those color receptors that just aren't responding because there's not enough light. However, if you look off to the side of the galaxy, and, and as we say, we look out of the corner of our eye at this object, all of a sudden it looks much brighter because now the light is falling onto the rods in your eye, which are more sensitive to the light. So you're not gonna get high resolution viewing you're not going to see color, but you're going to be able to detect them much better. Um, so one thing to, uh, to really look for is um, as when you first get this telescope, I would look for the planets. Also start looking for these Messier objects. They're named after Charles Messier, who is a French astronomer from the late 17, early 1800s. And he made a catalog of about 110 of these objects. And he found these faint fuzzy objects as he was searching for, uh, these, uh, for these other fuzzy objects, which we now call comets. Um, but he kept coming across these objects that weren't moving over the course of a few nights like comets normally do. So he made a note of where they were so that if he came across them again, he would immediately know if that was something he's already seen and dismissed as not being a comet. But there are galaxies, they're nebulae, they're star clusters, and they tend to be some of the brightest objects that you can see, uh, especially with the small backyard telescope. In fact, around March of every year, the sun is in the right position in among the stars that when it sets, it's possible, and you've got to be very determined to do this and you have to stay up all night, but you can actually see all 110 objects over the course of the night from that sunset to the next sunrise. So it's called a Messier Marathon. And that's often when we have these spring star parties where uh, astronomy groups like the Barnard Seaford Astronomical Society get together and you know, do these star parties and they try to see how many of these objects they can get. Can't use a, a, one of those uh, robotic telescopes because that's cheating because it'll go to every one of them. So it's the, it's the whole game of trying to find these objects which makes it so much more fun than, um, than being uh, you know, just shown each one of them by um, a robotic telescope. So um, let's see, I, oh, one final little thing here. We didn't talk too much about photography um, doing long exposure photography requires a, a good setup. So it's going to be one of these situations where if you want to get one of those really gorgeous pictures, let's say like, uh, the picture that's on the cover of this book here, um, that's going to require a, a, a telescope that is very well aligned. So it tracks the stars very, very well. It's going to require better uh, equipment. Uh, it's more sensitive. It's going to require dark sky conditions. So that's more, uh, that's more getting into the advanced side, okay? Um, but there are a number of objects, especially with smartphones, that you can actually get images of. Um, the moon is an easy one. Uh, the planets are, are, are pretty easy as well. Uh, I say easy in a relative manner. The, the moon is the easiest, but planets you can get with a, a smartphone. But... Um, there are even these little smartphone adapters where this is basically just, so here's my eyepiece for my telescope, taking it off. And this, this particular one, it slips over that. It's got a little mechanism to tighten down on that. You pop that in your telescope. And so it will allow you to then, where's my, my phone go? Oh, lost my phone again. Um, but you, let's imagine that this is my phone. It can just then just set my phone on it and get it positioned right. I don't have to worry about balancing it right. I just lay it down there and get it centered over the, the aperture. And then I can take a picture of the moon or Saturn or, or 
whatever. And if you have a telescope that will actually track, follow these objects, you know, some of the, the smartphones can do um, uh, maybe up to like a 30 second exposure. You can even start to get some of these faint fuzzy objects. So they're not gonna be super duper images, but still it's really cool that you're able to get it even with um, a, uh, a smartphone. So um, with that, I think that I have gone way over, um, hopefully not, but um, let's go ahead and take some questions if we've got some. Hey, Billy. Hey. Um, we just have a few questions, so it should okay. be too late. Um, Kathy says, I live in Nashville. Any advice for observing from the city? Uh, from the city, that's, yeah, that's the, the tough part. Um, if you're more around downtown, um, you'll, you'll still be able to get things like the planets and, and the moon, obviously. Um, fainter objects like nebulae and galaxies, that's going to be much, much more difficult. But um, one of the things that I really started looking for when I um, got my first Opsonian telescope and was learning the night sky was going out and trying to find uh, individual stars and constellations. And you may say, well, that, that sounds really boring. But what I was looking for were these double stars. So these are stars that are, in, in many of the cases that I was looking at, are physically orbiting around one another. Now you won't actually see them orbiting, but they will appear next to one another in, in, the, uh, in the telescope. And a lot of these you can actually see with uh, the naked eye. Um, and so what I was doing was trying to find all of these different double stars. And some of them are, are, the components are pretty far apart, so it's easy to spot them. But others, they end up appearing so close together that, uh, in some cases, it really helps, it, it kind of tests uh, your telescope's ability to resolve uh, these particular pairs. And so I found it to be a lot of fun trying to find uh, these, these double stars. Um, you know, there are even things like asteroids, like Ceres or, or, or Vesta. Um, if they happen to be up in the sky, you can actually observe those guys. They appear like little stars. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be somewhat faint. But um, if you're near the city, you should still be able to pick them out. It just might be a little bit harder to find them at first since you've got to use other stars as references uh, to find those. Um, and there are also, you know, if you're not too terribly light polluted, you know, if you've got some light pollution, but not too terribly light polluted, you can also get uh, filters for the eyepieces. There are these uh, filters that are often referred to as sky glow filters. Um, but basically what they're doing, uh, when you look at them, they kind of look like a bluish color. Uh, so if you put them on your, your eyepiece and you look at the moon, it's going to give it kind of a blue hue. But these are mainly for trying to look at objects that are uh, kind of these faint fuzzy objects, like these, uh, these things I call like planetary nebulae. Uh, in fact, one of them, uh, this is the uh, Helix Nebula. That's an example of one. But what it will do that filter, it blocks out most light except for certain colors or certain portions of the rainbow. And the colors it lets through are the colors that these nebulae tend to emit. And the colors it blocks out are the colors uh, that are really prominent in city lights and street lights, especially like those orange sodium lights. It really won't let any of that through. So it tends to help make the sky appear a little bit darker and make your, your nebulae pop out just a little bit more. So um, it's not a cure-all, like if you were in downtown, you'd still have a heck of a time even with one of the filters being able to see that. But uh, it can help improve the views a little bit. Um, we've got them here at the observatory and uh, it is pretty impressive uh, what they can do if you've got the right filter. Uh, the, the better the filter, or what we say is the narrower the band pass, the more expensive they end up being, but you know, just goes to figure. So it is still possible to do some uh, deep sky observing towards the city. It's just going to be harder to do. I've, I've seen through your telescope with the filter and it, it really makes a huge difference. It really does. And isn't there a thing like baffling built into some telescopes that give you a surprisingly good image? Yes. Yeah, so um, let's see, I don't know. Well, this one might show it a little bit. So this is my little Maksudov Cassegrain. I'm going to try to get right up to the camera, try to get a good view here. It's, it's so hard to do. Um, but actually, you can kind of see it there. So you can see the reflection of the mirror in there. In fact, you can see my finger. 
Now you see that this spot right here that's on the front, but you notice that my finger looks like it's going behind a black piece right there. That's actually a tube that is coming up from that central hole in this mirror. And it's, it's called a baffle and it is made or it is put in there so that if you have, say, if you're looking right here and there's a street light over here and you've got light coming in from that, that street light, that baffle tube prevents that light from being able to get down into the eyepiece. So the, some of that light may be able to enter the baffle tube, but it'll be coming in at an angle. And as it tries to reflect, there are ridges within that baffle tube that help to keep that light from getting any farther down. So basically the only way light can get through, uh, get down to the very bottom of that baffle tube is if it is, if your telescope happens to be looking at the object that is uh, emitting that light. So uh, yeah, the telescopes, they have ways of preventing the, the, um, the light from getting to the eyepiece. But the problem is when we have uh, all this light going up into the atmosphere, the atmosphere tends to scatter that light. So uh, you're looking through some of that, that reflected light as you're looking at your object and that reflected light is able to actually get down into the tube as well. So, um, but yeah, the, the baffles and the telescope help prevent stray light from getting in there. But if you're just in a light polluted area, it, it's hard to overcome. Um, and you can overcome it a little bit with things like those filters. I live next to an office park in Brentwood and I was astonished how well I could see the Pleiades through my very inexpensive telescope yeah. um, because of the baffling. Um, Greg asks, can the Dobsonian do photography? The Dobsonians can do photography. Um, if you have the, well, let me back up. If you wanna do something like planetary photography, one of the, or when you see these really nice images taken by amateur astronomers, especially, uh, of, you know, showing a really detailed image of Saturn and you can see the rings very nicely, that's not a single shot. That is typically done by taking a video of, of Saturn and, um, and, and we do this sometimes at our, our virtual star parties, but you take, let's say a few thousand frames of a video. And as the air is moving across uh, your field of view and it's getting in between you and Saturn, making Saturn kind of wobble a little bit, there are periods where the air will kind of stop a little bit and you'll get a pretty good view of, um, of Saturn. And so if you take one of these videos, there are software packages. In fact, a lot of them are free um, where uh, the program will automatically go through and it will select out the best frames from that video. And um, it will then take those out and it'll stack them and average out um, a lot of the little inconsistencies and give you a, a, a much nicer final image. And so for like a Dobsonian, even if it's not tracking, since they have a wide field of view, typically you can put your camera in there and start the video and as Saturn or whatever is drifting through because you know the sky appears to move, um, then you can get that video and then afterwards the software will go in and it will, um, it'll be able to follow Saturn. And when it pulls out those frames, it'll then realign everything so that Saturn is, uh, all the images are aligned directly on top of one another. So that's one way that you can do photography. Uh, the moon, because it's so bright, you can typically do uh, single images of that, especially if you do wide field views, but you can do the same method of that, that tracking and stacking uh, that we mentioned. Um, the, the, the Dobsonians that can move by themselves that have the, the computerized go-to function, uh, they can track. The problem though is that because you have a very long telescope, if there's any subtle variation in how it moves, you know, you've got a, a very long lever arm. So if you make a little bit of movement down here, it's going to result in the very far away end moving quite a bit. So doing long exposure photography is a little bit more difficult with a Dobsonian telescope because of that. So that's one reason why the, um, like the, um, the Schmidt Cassegrains are often uh, the kind of the, the choice for this style of, or for uh, especially long exposure photography, because they're very compact. So um, it, they don't have to worry so much about them kind of jiggling, if you will. So in short, yes, there are different ways that you can do photography with the Dobsonian. The planetary stuff is easier than the deep sky stuff, but um, you can also do, for example, short exposures, maybe like 30 second exposures and just do multiples of those. And after you process them, then you can stack them. And so 
um, effectively 10 30 second exposures becomes a, a five minute exposure if they were all good exposures. Um, there are some drawbacks to doing many little exposures, but still you can start to, to do some deep sky photography with that. William asks, can DSLRs be used for astrophotography as well as dedicated cameras you had purchased for a telescope? Yes. Uh, in fact, a lot of the manufacturers of telescopes like, uh, or, or of, uh, cameras like um, uh, Canon, uh, and even some of the telescope manufacturers themselves, they will have uh, T-ring adapters. So um, you can either, like when we're looking at our, our eyepiece here, so this is our two inch eyepiece and the, the chrome part is what slides into the barrel and you lock down, um, they'll have an adapter uh, that um, it's basically this barrel and then it's got a little T-ring on it that you can then lock into your camera. So um, you, you take the, the, the front lens assembly off and, and replace it with that T-ring adapter and you just pop it in place where the eyepiece would be. And so it, it works really well. Um, and let's see, what was the other part of the question? Was it about the dedicated? So you can get dedicated uh, cameras for astronomy. They typically will have a, a barrel adapter with them. Um, or they can be more permanently mounted to a telescope. Uh, those tend to be um, made specifically for very long exposures. And so they will have uh, com uh, electronic components uh, called Peltier coolers that are built into those so that as you're doing these long exposures, the, um, uh, the heat that actually builds up on the, 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 the detector chip can cause a false signal. It causes in the in image, it causes like a, a glow in the image. And so the Peltier cooler keeps that chip very cold and uh, therefore reduces that amount of noise. And so um, the, the dedicated astronomy cameras are really good at uh, being able to compensate for that noise and giving you a much cleaner image. There are ways to counteract that when you're doing like DSLR. Uh, for example, you can do, let's say it was a I've done this before when I was uh, out of the country. I did a 45 minute exposure when I was down in Chile. I actually set up my camera outside and had it exposed for 45 minutes. And in the end, um, I got my image and I could see my star trails, but the, the image was really, kind of, wasn't grainy, but you could see there were a lot of red pixels and green pixels, and that's that noise that builds up. So then what I did is put the, made sure the camera was at the same temperature and um, I put the cap on it so no light could get into it, and I did a 45 minute dark image. And so since there's no actual light coming in, any signal that was on that picture would just be the noise that it built up. And so then I took that image and subtracted it from my original image, and then voila, you have this much, much nicer image. So, you know, even if you can't do, um, you know, a good cooling uh, on your camera, it, it's still, you know, it's possible to do these, um, uh, deep sky photography with a DSLR. Um, you just have to do some uh, image calibration afterwards, which actually you have to do that even with a dedicated telescope camera is just not as severe as what you have with a DSLR. All right, Matthew has what he calls the big question. Oh. Right, right now, the price of a new telescope is 50 to 200% higher than last year due to COVID affecting supply as well as higher demand, or is a good place to buy used quality telescopes? Uh, this actually came up in our star party. Um, the one thing that really comes, or there were two places that were mentioned. Uh, one was Astromart. Um, that's where a lot of people put on, uh, put their, their used equipment on there. Um, if I remember correctly, you may have to pay to join that site, but don't quote me on that. Um, you may have to do some research on that. Um, cloudy Nights, I can't remember if it's cloudynights.com or .net. That's another great place where um, uh, amateur astronomers will uh, get together and discuss topics or they'll put stuff up for sale. Um, you know, and there might be stuff on, on, on Craigslist or eBay, I'm not sure. But of course, you know, that may not be more of a I don't want to say reputable, but if you're, if you're going to someplace like Astromart or Cloudy Nights, nice, that's more likely going to be, say, um, seasoned amateur astronomers who are, are upgrading their equipment. So they've got this other equipment. They know it very well. They can describe it very well. You basically know what you're, you're getting uh, for uh, you know, uh, 
and what you're paying for. So those are the two main places that I would go. Um, there might be another, but I honestly cannot think of one off the top of my head. So I'd give those a shot. Um, and I think that they would be your best bet. Kyle asks, what kind of budget would you set for a beginner's telescope, but still an effective one? So um, like I was mentioning before, if uh, like the, the little four and a half inch telescope, um, you know, that's going to start probably a little over 100, uh, probably wouldn't get to 200. I think the, the, the four inch one, the, the taller one in the back there, that would get closer to 200 under normal pricing conditions, you know, like we just had pointed out. Um, if, you're, if you're really just starting to wet your feet and you're not sure if this is the hobby that you wanna go for, then I would say start out with one of those. If you can go up a little bit higher in budget, a six inch is going to, uh, that's going to gather almost two times as much light as what a four and a half inch will gather. Uh, so you'll get a little bit of an improvement there. Um, I would, you know, if, if it was me, I would say start with a six inch, but if, if you're still not sure, especially if prices are higher than the four and a half inch there, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, especially if, um, you know, if, if you just want to start looking at the moon or the planets or finding some double stars, um, or even if you've got decently dark locations, you'll be able to see some of these uh, fainter objects like these nebulae. That might be a, a, a way to go because you're not going to spend too, ter too terribly much at the beginning. Um, and you can really see if this is kind of the thing that you, uh, you know, if this is really whetting your appetite or you may find this, yeah, it's not really my thing. So then you're not going to be out that much money. So, um, but again, I would definitely go with one of the, uh, the Dobsonian. If you went with a hundred dollar refractor, then that's going to be a much smaller aperture, and um, you're, you're not going to be able to see quite as good, especially when dealing with uh, that chromatic aberration, which it's not a huge thing, but it can get kind of annoying at times, especially when you're looking at the moon or some of the planets. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, but um, uh, there was something else that came up. Oh. Um, it, regarding the previous question about where to, to look for these used equipment. You can also try, um, like here, if you're here in Nashville, you can try contacting the Barnard Seaford Astronomical Society because there may be members there that have, you know, over the years, they've uh, bought bigger and better telescopes and now they're starting to get a collection and they might be looking at possibly getting rid of one of theirs, who knows. That's it for viewer questions, but I have a question. Okay. <laughs> it was when you're talking about eyepieces. Um, yes. the, the eyepieces that give you a larger field of view, mm -hmm. does that affect the quality of the view at all? It, it, would it be a loser, lower resolution or would it be comparable? No, it would be very comparable. Um, so you don't typically get these huge fields of view with uh, a cheap eyepiece. It's going gonna, it's gonna to end up costing you because you have to have a lot of optical elements. So like the, um, let's see, where did it go? So this little plossel, let me take this off. If I remember correctly, this one, it, you know, it looks like one, maybe two lenses in there. It's actually four lenses in there. Um, but some of these really big eyepieces like that large one that I showed, um, they can have eight or nine, or I think there's even some that have even more of those uh, to really widen the field of view, but you still retain that image quality. But yeah, if you ever get a chance to look through those, I mean, they're, especially at a dark sky location, they're really phenomenal because I mean, this one, you know, I can get to about right, well, let me take my filter off, this little plossel you know, I can get to about right here and, you know, my eye is, or my eyebrows just barely touching that and I can see the edge of the, the field of view. Um, but for the, those really nice ones, I mean, you, you get your eye right up to it and you, I mean, you literally are just kind of moving around to see everything. It's, it's really spectacular. Well, I don't see any other questions on here. Last call for questions. And if you have one and, and you lost it, um, yeah. you know, we've got our contact link on our website. So please feel free to uh, shoot us an email and we will try to give you the, the best advice that we can.
Okay. All right. So um, if there are no more questions, um, again, I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. And uh, again, be sure to stay tuned to our website for our upcoming events in uh, December because we've got uh, two guest speakers that'll be doing talks in December. We have our, our star party at some point in December. Um, that'll probably be, uh, I want to say like the third week, definitely before the holiday season. Um, and then we do have a special viewing coming up uh, around the 20, I think it's on the 21st. So uh, with that, uh, um, again, thank you all for joining us. And thanks again to Alex Rockefeller, Helen Morissette, Nathan Griffin, and Brian Smokler for helping make this possible. And so hope to see you all next month. And um, if I don't, happy holidays.